As we've referred to earlier today, one of the uh, keys coming out of this whole uh, series of summits has been the equine injury database. Uh, Dr. Tim Parkin of the uh, University of Glasgow is a well, world renowned for uh, doing studies on, uh, on racing safety. I'm familiar with uh, uh, studies in other countries that he's done, and we're delighted that he is uh, on, our, uh, on this case, and he's going to give a report on what he's found uh, in analyzing the injury uh, database. Dr. Tim Parkin. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'd like to thank the Jockey Club and uh, Grace and Jockey Club Research Foundation for inviting me back to come and give you an update on where we're at with the EID. Um, any of you that were here two years ago might remember that I said uh, we were only one year into the collection of data for EID at that stage, and it was very preliminary to give any definitive results on some of the things that we were identifying and, and looking for statistical significance with respect to. And I'm glad to say that uh, since that uh, initial update, some of the findings have changed. And I'm also glad to say that I did preempt that that might be the case, um, given that we only had one year of data at that time. So what I intend to do today um, is really give you an update on where we're at with respect to the descriptive analyses from the equine injury database and then let you have an idea of where we've been in the last couple of years trying to take those data a little bit further to help us, as Mary said, identify horses that regulatory vets on the track and trainers indeed should be um, taking a little more interest in in terms of their risk of suffering a, a fatal or a non-fatal injury while racing. So the outline really is to, I'm gonna give you what the strategic aim of the, the bigger picture is um, as I said, talk about three years' worth of EID data. Talk about the models, the, math, the statistical models that we've completed. Uh, and then just give you the results of a model that was focusing on claiming races. And there's a very good reason for that that you'll see in a minute. And then just highlight where I believe the next potential steps should go. So our aims really were, the overarching aims are really to be, give us a better idea to be able to quantify the risk of fatal injury for individual horses entering races in North America. So are we better able to identify those horses that um, I used to refer to as at risk, but um, we now refer to those horses that might be of greater interest to us. Um, and the objectives of the recent work were to validate uh, previously developed models to see how predictive they were on a new data set, which is something that is very rarely done in our particular field uh, in the area of racing injuries. So you basically develop a, predict a, a model uh, that tells you which, what are the risk factors that might be associated with the outcome, and then you test that model against a new set of data that wasn't used to develop the original model. Um, and then to identify really subsets of the racing population that are potentially at significantly greater risk of injury from those predictive models. But as I said, I just wanted to give you an update where we're at with respect to descriptive analysis first. So um, in terms of participant numbers, and these were just updated last night, um, uh, 89 flat tracks, uh, flat racing tracks in the US, um, in North America are now contributing to the EID. All the National Steeplechase Association tracks are contributing, and that covers a remarkable 93% of all flat racing days uh, throughout the year, and obviously all steeplechase racing days. To give you an idea, um, the size of the task that Mary really uh, embarked upon a few years ago, the EID database now includes more than 40,000 uh, equine injury data point records, and they, they vary in a great deal from fatality through to minor injuries, but there are more than 40,000 separate data entry points on the, just on the equine injury database database. Uh, and that, we, we take th those data and then match them up with um, the racing data 
to, to then use uh, the data combined to produce models that uh, um, we can then derive some uh, interest from and potentially identify horses at risk of injury. Um, before I get to describe the data for the last three years, just a few notes of the changes that we made in the way we do that. Um, fatalities are now defined as fatalities that occurred within 72 hours of the race date. We noticed that there were several, uh, relatively few fatalities that were occurring a couple of months post race date. And it's clearly um, uh, less informative to include those uh, fatalities in the race date uh, fatality figures. So you can argue about where the cutoff should lie, but essentially we've taken a cutoff of 72 hours within the race date as being the one that we would include to uh, suggest that that fatality was associated with a particular race. Um, EID data uh, that we originally used started November the 1st. That created some problems for us, obviously, as you can imagine, it made it more difficult to describe the data. So from this year, we've actually moved to a calendar year uh, description of the data that makes it a lot easier to explain. Um, I'll give you point estimates of the incidence of fat uh, fatality uh, stratified by different criteria at different points. Uh, the, in, the important thing is that all of those point estimates have what we call 95% confidence intervals around them. So although our best guess about the incidence at a particular strata is the point estimate, it is possible that the actual uh, incidence rate is somewhere between the, two the upper and lower 95% confidence interval. And that tells us something about the degree of uncertainty we have with respect to with the data we're dealing with you'll notice that where we have more starts involved, then the confidence interval is very much more small because we're much more certain about the point estimate that we have. You'll see those come up in a minute. I'll, I'll, I'll explain those to you. Um, as I said at the beginning, there have been some changes since the last EID descriptive report, uh, and essentially you'll, you'll see those in a minute, but it does highlight the importance of waiting to acquire sufficient data to be sure about the findings but also not taking a single year as being necessarily representative of what is going on uh, in North American racing as a whole. And then finally, um, just to note that we are producing multivariable models, which I'll go on and talk about uh, the claiming model that we've, we've uh, developed um, later on. So uh, we'll talk about that in a minute. So these are what, um, I don't have a pointer actually. Has anyone got a pointer? So these are what the graphs, the next three or four slides are going to look like. They've got graphs like this. And essentially, along the uh, x-axis here, you have the different strata. So this, this one uh, is track surface. So this is all races. This is turf, dirt, synthetic. Um, and this is the years that they span. So this is the full three years, 2009, 2010, 2011, of the EID racing data. And this is the number of fatalities per 1,000 starts. And you can see here, um, all races, then we end up with a figure around the 1.9 per 1,000 uh, starts, number of fatalities per 1,000 starts. But then if we break it down into turf, dirt, and synthetic, then you see we get quite different figures. Dirt is over 2, uh, uh, turf is around the 1.6, and synthetic is around 1.3 per 1,000 starts. And you can see that because this incorporates all races, then the confidence interval, which is represented by these bars here, is very much smaller than it is for all of these. There are more dirt races than anything else, so the confidence interval around this estimate is very much smaller than it is for turf and synthetic. So the question you have is, are these um, estimates significantly different from each other? And what you'll see now um, are p-values, which essentially we're looking for p-values less than 0 0.05, which essentially tell us that we've achieved, we've identified a difference that is likely to be true uh, and is less likely to be uh, a chance finding. So when we see a very small p-value like that, then we're suggesting that that's very, very likely to be a true finding in the data that we have. So we can say that, yes, we're definitively sure that dirt races prevent a greater risk of uh, fa fatality than turf races do. Now, the other aspect of this is we want to be able to quantify what that difference is. And the way we do that is we generate what is known as a relative risk and this gives us the uh, relative risk of uh, fatality in a turf race compared to a dirt race. And essentially, horses are about 0.8 times less likely 
to end up uh, fatally injured in a turf race than they are a dirt race. And again, around these estimates, we have confidence intervals. So we know although our best guess is around 0.8, then actually the risk, uh, the relative risk could be anywhere between about 0.7 and 0.9. We can then obviously compare dirt and synthetic. And again, we see a very small p-value telling us we've got a highly statistically significant difference. And on this occasion, then essentially the difference, the relative risk between synthetic and dirt is about 0.6. So a horse starting in a synthetic race, uh, in a race on a synthetic track, is about 0.6 times less likely to end up fatally injured than a horse starting on dirt. And then finally, and this is where we didn't identify significant differences last time, we do identify now a significant difference between turf and, turf and synthetic as well, where horses racing on synthetic are about 0 0.75, 0 0.76 times less likely to end up with a fatal injury than those racing on turf. So now, given, given three years' worth of data, we can clearly differentiate between three different surface types uh, with just descriptive analyses. The important thing to remember is that these only take account of the uh, surface themselves, and they don't take account of any other factors. As Mick alluded to this morning, it's important to remember that those synthetic tracks are very different, different tracks to the dirt tracks, potentially. They have different populations of horses uh, racing on them. So what we do need to do is to uh, derive the multivariate models that take into account all the confounding factors, and you'll see um, some of that later on. Um, I also looked at uh, the change, the trends that we've got uh, over time in 2009, 2010, 2011 on uh, all surfaces, so if this, this is how the, the incidence rate has gone from in 2009 at around 2, 2010 around 1.9, uh, and 2011 about 1.9, and that's on all tracks. Um, then I also compared to see whether there had been a significant drop since 2009 to 2011, and uh, this, this difference here is not statistically significantly different. We looked at the same on turf. Again, the difference is not statistically significant. Same on dirt. You see there's a slightly different pattern on dirt where, yes, it drops in the first two years, but then it seems to be leveling off for whatever reason that may be. Again, not statistically significantly different. And then on synthetic where, indeed, there does appear to be um, improvement year on year, but again, still not statistically significant. We've got a p-value that's greater point than 0 0.05 here suggesting that there's no statistically significant difference between the incidence rate on synthetic in 2009 compared to 2011. Nevertheless, I don't think it's right that we should all, always uh, suggest that if you get a p-value that um, is greater than 0 0.05, we should dismiss it. It is simply the case that we probably don't have sufficient power to identify that difference. And it probably is the case that there is a, a, a difference between those two. And, and certainly, looking at those plots, it looks like the, the trend is going in the right direction. If you saw something very different, you'd be much more worried. If we then incorporate uh, surface condition into here, so looking at turf uh, tracks and synthetic, so turf uh, labeled as firm, good, yielding, and soft. And you see the vast majority of races on turf are on firm, because you've got very much more smaller confidence intervals. Very few relatively races on soft and yielding. But you compare those to uh, fast synthetic, which is um, the vast majority, almost all uh, synthetic uh, conditions were re rated as fast. Then you compare the firm turf with fast synthetic, and it appears there is a significant difference between the two. With fast synthetic being a start on fast synthetic uh, relating to a, a risk of about 0.74 compared to that on firm turf. I compared these three together and identified that there were no significant differences between those three, good, yielding, and soft, as you might expect. And when you do that, then you cannot identify a difference uh, between racing on firm turf uh, and any other type of condition on turf, so the p-value is greater than 0 0.05. And equally, if you compare fast synthetic with anything softer than firm on the turf, then actually it appears that this is not significantly less risky than uh, racing on turf, uh, good, yielding, or soft. We do the same with dirt and synthetic. So this is, these are the dirt categories here, fast, very wet, fast, good, sloppy, and muddy. And you can see that there's no real trend here with respect to the dirt tracks. Vast majority, again, of the dirt races are raced on fast dirt. And indeed, 
we see that difference that we've already really identified between uh, dirt and synthetic. Uh, fast synthetic presenting about a 0.6 uh, level of risk compared to relative risk compared to fast dirt. Again, if we say that all these three are not significantly, these four are not significantly different from each other, which, which is the case, then you actually don't identify a difference within dirt itself, comparing fast to anything else. But you do identify, obviously, a difference between fast synthetic and anything else off uh, fast dirt. Uh, and it's about a 0.6 um, uh, reduction in risk if you're on fast synthetic compared to off fast, uh, off dirt, sorry. So that's the descriptive analyses done uh, that we've gone through before. We have stratified by a number of different criteria, but I'm deliberately not going into those because I don't want it to confuse the picture with respect to the models that we produce. They're actually what we should really be um, uh, concentrating on because they account for the confounding effects of lots of different variables on each other. The models we've conducted, uh, produced so far, and um, I should say that these models take a, quite a while to produce. They're, they're quite data intensive. We're now dealing with more than a million uh, race records when we deal with these data. And they require quite a lot of data manipulation and, and creation of new variables, depending on what the data tells us as we go through. Um, so they're not a, a small feat to, to undertake. But we have created um, a model for fatal distal limb fracture in all races. The first version of that, uh, I did last year, last summer, uh, and presented uh, the initial findings at the round table last summer. Uh, version two of that was created by uh, Richard Ridden, my PhD student, um, who's soon to finish up. He was seconded by the US Jockey Club for a couple of months this summer to specifically work on uh, uh, these data. Um, and he improved that, uh, that model uh, simply by uh, giving it more time and, and, and allowing uh, the data to uh, change a little bit and create new variables and, and improve the fit of the model. So that's a version two of that model we created this year. And then in, in addition to that, um, we also created a, a, a model that looked at fatal distal limb fractures in claiming races only. Uh, and again, that was something that Richard did um, under my guidance uh, this year as well. The rest of the talk uh, will focus particularly on claiming races. And the reason for that is in the whole um, race model, one of the things we identified that was uh, the risk of catastrophic lower limb fracture in a claiming race is 1.8 times greater than the risk in a non-claiming race. So there is clearly an association between the risk of fatal injury in a claiming race compared to non-claiming races. And because we wanted to identify some specific risk factors associated with claiming races, we couldn't do that when we looked at the whole uh, database looking at all races. We wanted to, for example, investigate the relationship between the ratio of purse price and claiming price. Uh, and clearly, if you include uh, races that aren't claiming races in that, then that, that, uh, that you end up with a whole load of missing data. So it makes it very difficult to fit those models. So we specifically focused in on just claiming races for what I'm going to talk about for the next um, few minutes. There were a number of significant risk factors. I think in the end, more than 12 significant risk factors for uh, fatal catas uh, catastrophic lower limb fracture in, in claiming races. I'm just presenting the seven uh, most significant and those with the uh, strongest effects uh, uh, in terms of the likelihood that a horse would end up with one of these injuries. And then finally, at the end, I want to just talk about how we may be able to use these, uh, this information uh, to help regulatory vets on the ground. Um, so these are the seven risk factors we identified. And I'm going to go through each of these in turn, but being, basically being an intact or entire male. Uh, the ratio of purse to claiming price. Current age was important. Uh, the size of drop in claim price since the last race was significant as well. And that's kind of an interesting finding. Um, Raced it, whether they'd raced in the last two weeks, the number of starts within the previous 15 to 13, 30 days prior to the current race, so the two weeks prior to that two-week period, and then whether they were within a three races of a break from racing that was more than 180 days. So had the horse taken a 180-day break from racing, for whatever reason, we don't know the reasons for that, and if, it, if that had happened, were they... Uh, still within three races of that 180-day break. So the first finding was uh, this relationship between intact or entire males. Um, and essentially, intact males, 
colts um, or horses or Ridgelings, essentially, very few Ridgelings, were three times more likely to end up with a, a, a catastrophic lower limb fracture than females or geldings. The ratio of purse to claiming price was an interesting one. This is um, something that didn't immediately come across my radar, but one of our conference calls sort of highlighted it to us. And just to explain what this, this is down here. So we've got our purse to claiming price ratio. It can go from 0 to 1.3. It's in three categories here, simply because that's the way that the data fell out and it fitted the data best. Uh, greater than 1.3 to 1.8, or actually gr greater than 1.8. So this group here, their uh, purse price was uh, 1.8 times their claiming price in a particular race. And the values you see here are the odds ratios. So essentially, this group here, uh, compared to those horses that had a purse to claiming price ratio of 0 to 1.3, were 1.7 times more likely to end up with a fatal or a catastrophic lower limb fracture than these horses here. This group here, where you had a, a very high ratio of purse to claiming price, were almost two and a half times more likely to end up with um, a fatal or catastrophic lower limb fracture than this group here, which, either, which had a very low purse to claiming price ratio. Current age was important. Um, previously, I've talked about age at first race. Um, this age at first race didn't come into this claiming only uh, claiming race only model. For what reason, uh, I'm un unsure, but it, uh, it appeared to be slightly confounded by this, this variable here. And in fact, age at the current race was a much more significant variable. And it suggested that basically, if you're a two-year-old, then you're essentially at lower risk. If you're more than three, you're three or more, then essentially you are 2.4 times more likely to end up uh, fatally injured with a lower limb, uh, a catastrophic lower limb fracture than the two-year-old horses. I should say, at this point, it, this seems right, rather like a, a bit of a, an abrupt cutoff, but essentially we, we model these data in a number of different ways, looking at to see whether there's a continuous relationship here, whether we take a number of different cutoffs. So we change this cutoff, say, we would have looked at whether two-year-olds, three-year-olds, four-year-olds uh, were the best cutoff to use for these particular data. And we always present the, the cutoff that provides the best fit of the model. So essentially enabling us to be most predictive in terms of our outcome. So although that seems like a rather abrupt cutoff, that, that there are statistical reasons behind that. Um, this is an interesting one as well. Um, a double drop in claiming price since the last race. Now, I had no idea what a double drop was when I uh, first talked about this. Um, it's, not a, it's not a term we use uh, in the UK, but I, I've, I've learned to understand what it means. And I should just say that these data themselves were actually from a group of tracks on a circuit uh, at which the same horses are likely to appear with similar claim price structure. We recognize that across the straits, claiming across the whole of the, uh, the states, North America, and then the claiming, claiming price structure is likely to be very different in different states. So this is a particular analysis that, were done, that was done on a particular group of tracks and particular group of horses. Now, the reference here, this is in three categories, but the reference here is um, horses that increased their claim price since the last race. And if you compare those to horses that had a drop of about $12,000, up to $12,000, um, then those horses that had this drop were two, two and a half times more likely since their last race, were two and a half times more likely to end up with a catastrophic lower limb fracture than these horses that had actually either stayed level or increased their claim price since the last race. If you take that even further and you identify these horses that had a drop of more than $12,000, then these horses were approximately three times more likely to end up with a lower limb catastrophic fracture than these horses that are actually increased in claim price. And clearly, you can hypothesize about the, the reasons behind this, um, but it's, the whole point about this is in enabling us to identify those horses that we should be most interested in, or, or regulatory vets on the track should be most interested in, in terms of identifying catastrophic fracture before these events occur. Uh, recent, recent racing history is always something we look into in very great detail wherever we can, and it's always something that throws up um, a number of different uh, risk factors uh, and in various different ways. I've picked out two here that um, refer to the very recent racing history, but there were others that referred to much greater uh, racing history periods, sort of up to a year prior to the event. 
but these are two that refer to the last four weeks, essentially. And this is a little small down here, but essentially it's supposed to be small. These are the horses that are at least risk of fatal uh, or catastrophic lower limb fracture. They're horses that have raced in the last two weeks, at least once, and raced at least twice in the two weeks prior to that. Okay, so they raced once in the last two weeks and then raced twice, at least twice, in the two weeks prior to that. These horses are the horses that are at greatest risk, where they've not raced in the last two weeks, and they only raced once or didn't race at all in the two weeks prior to that. So there are two definite two-week two, two week periods here that we're interested in. And then obviously you have horses that are kind of intermediate to those. These horses raced in the last two weeks, but only raced once or didn't race at all in the two weeks prior to that. These horses didn't race in the last two weeks, but they did race twice in the two weeks, at least twice in the two weeks prior to that. So the size and the color of the circle is supposed to, in some way, represent the level of risk that each of those different types of horse would be exposed to uh, if they were to appear in a race today. And essentially, the, the quantifying that difference in risk, if you go this way, so you go from horses, changing from horses that have had no race in the last two weeks to horses that have raced in the last two weeks, then the difference is around, around 1.6 times. If you go down this way, so in other words, horses that have raced once or not at all in the two weeks prior to that, compared to those that have raced at least twice prior to that, then they, these horses are about half as likely to end up with a lower limb catastrophic fracture than these horses that have raced um, once or not at all in the two weeks prior. And then obviously you have, you can then, so that's comparing across the way and down the way, but obviously you can compare on the diagonal here, and if you, can, if you multiply those two relative risks together, which is, is somewhat difficult to do because you have to, you have to take account of the confidence intervals, but it gives us some idea how much greater risk these horses would be at compared to these, then essentially these horses are more than three times more likely to end up with a lower catastrophic uh, limb fracture compared to those horses that we would regard as our safest in terms of their recent racing history. The, the other area we were interested in was uh, days since a break, a significant break in racing, and we defined significant break in racing in a number of different ways. We looked at breaks that were um, 90, 180, 270, and 365 days. And the one that came out as being interesting was this one here, a horse that had had a 180-day-plus break uh, from racing. And I just, on the plane on the, uh, on the way over here, I just put these two calendars together, totally artificial calendars just made up, but basically horses A, horse A and horse B. You can see this horse is racing relatively sporadically. This horse is racing very, very frequently. And this horse here has had a 211-day break in racing between this race and, and, and this race here. So these red crosses obviously indicate the day, dates of racing. Whereas this horse hasn't had a 180-day break at all. If we look at this race date here, which is today, and we say both of these horses are going to race today, then essentially this horse is still within three races of its 180-day plus uh, break from racing. This horse clearly isn't. It hasn't had a 180-day break from racing, so it's not within our definition of what would be a, a lower risk horse. And if you were to compare this horse with this horse, they're looking at the racing calendar, then essentially this horse would be about twice as likely to end up with a lower limb catastrophic fracture than this horse that had had, that was still within three races of its 180 day break. The interesting thing is that this 180 day break does actually sort of, uh, sort of talk very nicely to some of the work that Sue Stover does in terms of looking at how the bone remodels, how it repairs itself, and that sort of uh, period of break is, is a significant length of time that would enable bones to potentially repair, uh, remodel, and come back stronger than they would if you'd had a much shorter break of less than, say, three months. So there is some biological plausibility behind this finding that could actually uh, enhance the likelihood that it's a, a true finding. So how do we use... There's obviously a lot of information here, and I've only presented the the seven most significant risk factors, really. There are others that we identified with respect to claiming races, and there are others that we identified with respect to all races in, in toto. But how do we use this information at the track? Well, we can combine these, these and other risk factors together. Uh, the important thing is that we emphasize which of the risk factors are most important. Um, 
And what we're talking about now is potentially trying to generate an overall estimate of the degree of interest that a regulatory vet should show in any particular horse start. So how much of the, any horse uh, starting, how many of these risk factors boxes does it tick? So increasing its level of interest that we should have in it. Um, and essentially what we're trying to provide is simply a further tool to aid the use of the pre-race veterinary examinations for the regulatory vet. And the next couple of slides are very schematic, um, and they're not intended to be taken away as anything uh, that we should start to use or anything like that, but they're just trying to, trying to make the point. Um, if we ended up, with, I could see that this is, this is the end point that we may try and end up at. So a regulatory vet would, would have this automatic readout for every start um, at the beginning of a, a race day, and this is just horse A, and you might have the risk factors down here, and you don't even really need to label what these risk factors are for the regulatory vet on the, on the ground. The size of the, of the circle indicates how important that, that risk factor might be if it's present in that particular star. So, and I've logged them all in, I, I've uh, ranked them all in terms of importance here. So the more, most important, the most significant, uh, and the risk factor with the greatest strength of association with respect to the outcome are at the top, and those that are least important are down at the bottom, and they have much smaller circles. And then essentially you can say, okay, um, is this horse of interest with respect to its sex? Um, and you can say, okay, this horse was probably, m must be a female because it's not of interest. Uh, um, if it was a, a male, then this blob here would be in, in this column here. And you can go down, is it of interest? The, the, what, it can only be uh, female or male in the category we have, so we don't have anything in the middle for, for gender here. Um, if we look at ratio of purse to claiming price, then we do have three categories. You're just showing that you do. We have three categories from which we can pick. So a horse could be not of interest, moderately of interest, or, of in, or definitely of interest in that particular category. So you can see here, you can just draw a schematic like this. This particular horse would be of interest based on number of starts in the 15 to 30 day period and the fact that it, uh, it's, racing his, its recent racing history. But other than that, it's not particularly of interest. So you might end up with an overall level of interest in this horse that is uh, not really very interesting and unlikely to end up with a... Um, a fatal lower limb fracture uh, at the end of this race. And you could contrast that with horse B, who might have a very different profile. Very simply, same thing again, but actually it fits many of the uh, risk factor profiles that, present, that would suggest that this horse is something that should be flagged. And you end up with an overall risk that is actually in the definitely of interest column for this particular horse. And you can see that they, you know, this is the sort of thing that could very much readily be automated and could provide an extra tool for regulatory vets on the track. Just a note about that, though, that although there may be a 50 to 60-fold increase in risk between the lowest and highest risk starts, it's still very important to remember that even for the very highest risk start, the risk is very, very small. It's never really going to be over using these techniques over the level of about 1 to 3, 4%. So a horse entering a start, if it's got a risk of just of 1%, then essentially it could race 99 times and still be safe at the end of those 99 races, and then only on its 100th race would it end up with a fatal injury. So it has a 1% risk, but nevertheless, that 1% risk is 50 to 60-fold times greater than potentially the very safest horse taking a, making a start in that particular race. So we have always to remember that, and it's very difficult. It's not suggesting that we use any of these tools to pull horses out of races. It's simply suggesting that we need to use some of these tools to identify horses that may be of greater interest to us. Um, our further work over the next few years will we'll certainly um, produce models for other types of race. Um, we've talked about producing models for stakes races. And we've also looked at different outcomes. Um, one of the issues we have with respect to this is that because the prevalence of the outcome is still very low, then our risk is always going to be very low. But if we expanded that outcome to be sort of say, okay, a horse with a, a triage score of two plus when it's coming off the track, so expanding it to uh, non-fatal injuries as well as fatal injuries, then obviously the prevalence of those would be much higher. And essentially we might be able to be more certain in our identification of horses that are truly at risk and be more definitive about what we did with those individual animals. Um, and a, a further thing that we always need to do with these models is to validate the predictive ability of those models, which is something that, that does take a while uh, and, and we've come across a few glitches uh, while trying to do that over the summer, but it's something that we're embarking on uh, in the next uh, few months. Um, Finally, um, and I put this slide in just this morning, really, based on what 
some of what Mick was saying. And it, it's kind of a slide that I put together a few years ago, trying to give you an idea how important it is to be able to get as much information um, about all of these horses as possible so that we can maximize the potential impact of the epidemiological modeling that, that we do um, and whether that can lead to profiling and screening, for example. Um, this is in no way complete, but essentially we, have, we can gather information uh, related to racing, health, racetrack, um, services, for example, pedigree, horse, and training, about every start that is made. Um, uh, most of my work, obviously, is in the UK, but certainly every start that is made uh, in the US as well. And essentially, there, you can see there are a number of aspects uh, of data that are deficient in what we're trying to do at the moment. What we're dealing with at the moment is simply racetrack information and data, and there are a number of areas that we have yet to really mine into that um, are some of which are much more difficult to get hold of than others. But feeding into the, all of these different components, uh, we have different things that we, we would like to, obviously, uh, get information on. So, for example, with respect to racetrack maintenance, so obviously talking to Mick about that sort of stuff, um, uh, early, we heard the trainers talk about early management of uh, young stock, uh, but the nutrition and management of the horses in training, not just the training regimes, but how they're actually managed, um, farriery is something that is very rarely talked about apart from toe grabs um, and clearly a big area that uh, I believe is critical certainly to what is going on in North America is clearly the veterinary input and the medication and being able to get hold of uh, the medical records and examine those with respect to uh, the likelihood of injury should be critical. These areas in red are some of the areas that uh, our group are kind of working on at the moment. I've got a PhD student who's specifically working on turf track uh, race uh, ma maintenance. He's also working on the, the racing data, uh, which is related to horse data. I've got a second PhD student who's specifically looking at the genetics of some of these deleterious outcomes, identifying how much of the outcome is related to, to genetics. In addition to that, there's been a lot of work, certainly in the UK, that's looked at training regimes regimens to, to understand which of the training regimens uh, increase or decrease the likelihood of uh, fatal injury. But for me, the one area that still is sort of untouched is this area here, and I think we really need to um, move forward in being able to have our maximum impact if we can get hold of um, and understand some of the medical records of these horses. Just as an example, uh, and it's not complete medical records, we've recently done work on tendon injuries in uh, the UK, and horses uh, with a tendon injury were 20 times, that a, the, a tendon injury that occurred on the race course were 20 times more likely to then go on and suffer a career ending tendon injury when they came back to racing. Now, everyone knows in the racing industry that tendon injury is extremely difficult to heal and they often end up with a weaker tendon. But actually, explaining to trainers that actually, if you have a horse with a tendon injury on the track, it is now 20 times more likely to end up with a career threatening tendon injury is a kind of sobering thought. And, some, and in some ways, you'd hope that that would modify some of the decisions that trainers would make with respect to re-entering those straight horses for racing and indeed the owners, or deciding to make the decision to retire those individual horses. Uh, thank you all very much. I'd just like to acknowledge the uh, funding from the US Jockey Club that's uh, been uh, uh, provided to do some of this work. And Matt and Kristen uh, from the US Jockey Club, who are kind of invaluable as my sort of uh, go-to people if I've got any questions with, this, with respect to the data. Uh, and also need to acknowledge Richard Ridden, uh, my PhD student, who's soon to finish up, um, uh, who did a lot of the work over this summer. Thank you very much.